welcome to St. Paul's Online. It's so good to have you join us today. Whether you're on YouTube or Facebook or listening in on the phone, it's fantastic to have you with us. We really miss not being able to meet together in church, but I guess this is the next best thing. Um, and one of the good things coming out of this uh, uh, is that others who might not have been able to come to church are now able to join us online. I hope you're doing okay. Thanks to those of you who've emailed me recently or been in contact to ask how we're doing and to tell us that you're praying for us, such an encouragement and a comfort. And I want you to know that we're praying for you as well. God is good. This morning, we're gonna be hearing from our mission partners, Nick and Sarah in Vancouver in Canada. And those two really know how to do media stuff online. Debbie also is going to, um, going to be uh, sharing the family segment. She's incredibly creative. This week, Debbie's asking, what does a life of faith look like? Hello, St Paul's. Our thoughts and prayers are with you always, but especially during this season. Uh, we're so thankful for your ongoing prayers and support as we head towards planting a new church here on the west coast of Canada. It's a real joy for us to be able to bring you a quick update. Yeah, so we can hardly believe that it's been almost a year since we emigrated and God has been so faithful to us over that year and we are committed to launching Numa Church this September. Recently we've seen increased engagement in our community, especially on social media, and since the pandemic began we've been able to be a voice of hope to our city again through social media but we've also been able to partner along with other local churches with an organized organization called the city dream center and we've helped them pack and deliver 2,000 food hampers to those most in need yeah we've also started building our launch team but in reality these are hard times for everyone and there's certainly challenging times to be starting a church in so this season would have involved some physical interest meetings for us and we've had to shift that to online so about two weeks ago we hosted our very first online interest party uh, live on youtube where we shared our heart and vision and we invited people to partner with us through prayer through giving and primarily by joining our team we're going to be doing another one of those uh, in about a week's time on Friday the 22nd of May. Uh, we'd really appreciate your prayers that we connect with the right people and that God will add to our launch team through that. Yeah, we're also preparing a fundraising campaign towards our actual launch budget. Now, a lot of the financial support we've received so far has enabled us to live here for the last year. We've been able to lay the foundations, we've undertaken training and we're building the groundwork. But we're now entering a season of needing to purchase all the equipment and licenses as well as investing in the community outreach and essentially advertising the launch. Now, some of your giving has gone, will go into that continually, but yeah, we need to raise some more. <laughs> Yeah, now, obviously, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we don't know exactly what launching in September is going to look like. Um, like you, we're getting regular updates from our government. It's likely that we're going to see some restrictions being lifted, but it's unlikely that we're going to be able to have large gatherings uh, this year. And so we're currently trying to strategize as to what that's going to mean for us and how it might work for us. Almost certainly, we're going to have to establish online services and that means a whole new set of considerations for us in terms of different equipment and also how we can effectively establish community and invite people into relationship with Jesus. Yeah, so we just want to thank you again for all your prayer and support and three ways we particularly appreciate prayer at this time is that God would build our launch team that he would release the finances we need to set up the launch both online and physically as soon as we yeah. are able and that we could that he would give us wisdom and direction we need to launch well in the circumstances we're all facing so if any of you would like to know more you can visit our website at numa.church or find us on facebook or instagram at numachurchca god bless you Over the last two terms, we have asked the question in children's work, what does a life of faith look like? We've done this through following the lives of Joseph and David in the Bible. We have seen them trusting in God's promises, even when its times were hard and they felt like they were a million miles from the promises that he'd made. We've seen them following God's nudges, even when they don't really make sense. We have seen them leaning into God when they're feeling weak and finding refuge in him, 
asking for forgiveness and wisdom when needed. And we have seen them loving others and sharing his truth. But today, we want to look at this root of faith. Jesus sees it in so many people in the Gospels where we hear him say, your faith has. And it's like he sees that seed of faith in us when we dip our toe in the river of faith. It's that first tiny step. You see, it's not the faith that saves us, but the one we have faith in and who we trust in Jesus. Hebrews 11 describes faith this way. Faith is being sure of what is hoped for and certain of what we do not see. Each person who Jesus met had a choice to trust in what Jesus was saying or not. The smallest seed of faith is that first bit of trusting in Jesus and the rest grows from there. In Matthew chapter 13, we see over two verses this picture of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Which a farmer plants in a field. which grows into a strong tree. In which birds find shelter. The parable shows how small things grow in the kingdom. And we've seen how Jesus's work started off so small, but then it's here, enduring today. It has lasted so long and grown so much. But also the kingdom grows in us and it starts with a small seed and grows so that others are affected by it. When a seed is nurtured, it will grow. When we walk with the one we trust, it will grow. So whether your faith is a seed, a shoot or a fully grown tree, know that when you trust and hope in Jesus, it will endure. Because when we allow the farmer when we allow Jesus to help us along life's road, he will be there and nurture us so that our faith will grow in this muddy journey of life. Thanks, Debbie. Let's now turn to worship, which today is led by Sam. Psalm 147 says, Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. And that's what we're going to do right now. No matter what's happening in our lives or what's going on in the world, we can take comfort that God is in control. He loves you. He's with us. So let's pray. Lord, we welcome you today in our homes, wherever we are, watching or listening. We say, welcome, Holy Spirit. Come and meet with us now as we join together in worship and lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break, this broken lost the clouds praise. For he can stop the Lord's almighty. But our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting battles And every knee will bow before Him The God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Gates. 
Make way before the King of Kings Our God who comes to save Is here to send the captives free If you can stop the blood almighty The God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power And fighting real battles And every knee will bow before Him For our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow Before the Lion and the Lamb Yes, every knee will bow song confess that you are God that you are good for who can stop for who can stop the Lord Almighty for who can stop the Lord Almighty For who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 And every knee will bow before Him For our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Yes, every knee will bow To confess Stop you. So higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant through the trial and the
thanks Sam, it's so good to worship together. Miles is now going to lead us in prayer with an encouragement from Psalm 25 and then Camilla has our Bible reading today and after that Forrest is going to bring us the next message in our teaching series on Romans and today we're looking more deeply into uh, practically what it means to let our identity be shaped by Jesus and we're going to think about the significance of baptism and what that means for us but first let's turn to prayer and I'll hand over to Miles. Good morning in Psalm 25 David says these words to you O Lord I lift up my soul in you I trust O my God and then he says no one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame and as we come together in prayer this morning, let's remember that if we trust in God, we won't be ashamed or disappointed. We're going to start by praying for our church family at St Paul's. O oh Lord our God, we thank you that even though we've not been able to meet face to face, you have given us strong bonds of friendship and fellowship in our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that as the social restrictions begin to loosen, that those bonds will be refreshed and strengthened, and that any loneliness or discouragement will be lifted. At the same time, help us to avoid unnecessary risk and protect those who are vulnerable amongst us. We, pe we particularly remember this morning those amongst us who have been sick or bereaved, and we lift them before you now. Your word says you are the father of comfort and the God of all mercies. So we pray that you will pour into their hearts and minds your peace and your comfort. Amen. Every Sunday we remember in prayer uh, one or other of our mission partners, uh, those who have gone out from amongst us to serve God in different parts of the world. Today we're going to pray for Nick and Sarah Arkley and family who are working in Vancouver in Canada. Thank you Lord for the video news that Nick and Sarah have shared with us today. We thank you for the many ways you have provided for them so far and we ask you to guide and bless their endeavours to share the gospel and plant a new church. Please bring people to life-changing faith in Jesus through this work. Please pour out your Holy Spirit upon them. Amen. We're all very much aware at this time how much our nation needs God's mercy and help. In days gone by, they may have asked for a day of national prayer, and it seems that may be unlikely to happen. But as God's people, we can still pray for our nation, and we're going to do that now. Father God, we are saddened that our country has been so badly hit by the coronavirus pandemic and we feel for those who have suffered, whether by illness, bereavement or loss of livelihood. We pray for our government. We pray for our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Please give them wisdom and in all their decisions, guide them. Regarding the vital social and economic issues we face as a nation. Please help the scientific advisers to give clear and correct advice and especially to find effective treatments and most of all an effective vaccine that will ensure an end to the pandemic. We thank you for the development of the new antibody test which will help a lot. O Lord of compassion, hear our prayer. Amen. We also need to pray for our world. We know that God so loved the world that he gave his only son for it. So let's pray now. Lord, creator of this world, we ask you to have mercy, especially on those poorer countries for whom the pandemic can have such catastrophic consequences. Please, Lord, hold back the disease in India, in Africa, Syria, and also in refugee camps around the world. This month is also the month of Ramadan, 
and we pray for Muslim countries around the world. We know that Muslim background believers can face extra pressure at this time to return to Islam, so we ask you, Lord, to strengthen them in their faith. We pray also for Christians that they will have opportunity to show love to their Muslim neighbours and even be able to share the truth of the gospel with them. Lord Jesus, to Muslims who are seeking you, we pray you will reveal yourself in dreams and visions and help many more to learn about you on social media and on the internet. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Today's reading is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. Thank you, Camilla, for sharing that reading with us this morning. Well, we continue our study of this letter from Paul to Christians in Rome, written about 57 AD, so 25 years after Jesus' resurrection, but a long time ago from today. And it got me thinking, what can a letter from the distant past say to us this morning? I wonder, have you ever received a postcard or a letter reminding you of something from your distant past? Maybe a Facebook memory or a friend request? Well, this happened to me recently. I received a card reminding me of a trip to France from way back when I was in my early 20s. It amazed me how a card can have such a powerful effect. In an instant, I was transported back to that summer. Just 20 years old, I'd driven with a friend to visit his mum in northern Brittany. Probably the first time I'd ventured abroad. And this postcard, it stirred powerful, vivid memories. I remember the hot days eating in the local village routier, the cool evenings playing table tennis, the sound of the ping pong, and the smells of seafood cooking, and of course, the taste of the local Calvados. Ah, the carefree days of youth. And that summer was definitely a milestone in my life. Sometimes we need things like this. Triggers that remind us of key moments that have shaped us, These recollections, they refocus us, they energise us, they lift our spirits. And reflecting on them, it reminds us of how far we've travelled in life. Memories are powerful stimuli. Letters that remind us of life-changing events from a foreign country decades ago. And that's what we have in today's passage. This would have been a powerful reminder to the founding members of this small band of Christians. Some 25 years earlier, the same year that Jesus was crucified, some of these men had been far from their homes in Italy, in Rome. They had travelled overseas to Israel, to Jerusalem, for Pentecost, one of those three annual festivals which male Jews were expected to attend. Luke tells us it was 40 days after Jesus' resurrection 
and just 10 days since Jesus had ascended. God-fearing Jews and Jewish converts were visiting from Rome and on hearing a loud commotion coming from a house, they went to investigate. There they found a large crowd gathered watching a group of men, all praising God simultaneously in different languages. They felt this violent wind coming from heaven and then they saw like tongues of fire resting on different men. Well, while they were confused and perplexed, the apostle Peter stood up and he addressed the crowd. Peter explained how the Old Testament books anticipated this very event and even foretold the coming of Jesus. He explained the miracles of Jesus and the meaning and purpose of Jesus' death. Peter pleaded with the crowd, believe, repent and be baptised. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was a huge crowd. We know many heard Peter and that 3,000 who believed him were baptised that day. A colossal crowd and an unforgettable historic moment, the birth of the early church and a momentous life-changing event for each individual there as well. And that's for whom Paul now triggers that memory. Why does Paul do this? He wants to nip in the bud some wrong thinking that these readers may have formed following his previous chapter. What's the wrong thinking? Well, now that we are Christians, should we continue in sin? It's the idea that God's gift of forgiveness means it doesn't matter how they choose to live today. Now that they have heaven tomorrow, they can be hell raisers today. And Paul wants to state very clearly, categorically and comprehensively, no. Now we are Christians, we should not continue in sin. When we look at this Bible passage, we see it starts with the question, should we continue in sin? Now notice that little word in. It could so easily have read, should we continue to sin? But back in the previous chapter, Paul switched from talking about sins to discussing sin, from the actions to the principle. A couple of weeks back, we looked at Paul's list of sins when we studied Romans 1. And sins are those individual selfish acts of disobedience. But sin is that inclination to a godless selfish behaviour. Last week, in chapter 5, we saw that Jesus died for our sins. He paid the penalty for sins, and in God's eyes we are saved through Christ's death. But now Paul is saying that we also die with Christ. Not only does Christ die for our sins, but he also dies for our sin. That is, our sin, our selfish nature, is crucified with Christ. Christ deals with both the effect of sins and the power of sin over us. Now we are Christians, we should not continue in sin because we died to sin. More than any other concept, this passage mentions death. For a long time, it's been a taboo subject, but of late, it's very prominent in our conversations, our news media, and sadly, our personal experiences. But what does Paul mean by death? He doesn't mean death as extinction, but rather death as separation. For example, we see this in verse 2, where we died to sin does not mean our sinful nature is extinguished, but instead it means we are separated from it. It is no longer the determining force on our lives. Now we are Christians, we should not continue in sin because we identify with Christ. Paul starts this passage using the illustration of baptism as a shared experience for all Roman Christians. Yes, those baptised at Pentecost, as well as the more recent converts in Rome, and of course the Christians that we know arrived from across the empire, they all shared this baptism experience. It united them. Baptism in the early church was for everybody and was by full immersion. But the Greek word, has two meanings. The first meaning, the literal meaning, is to dip or immerse, 
The water baptism is an act of obedience and a public declaration of a profound life change. The submersion in water is symbolic, a series of three acts that corresponds to the redeeming acts of Christ. The immersion, the going under of the water, corresponds to Christ's death. The submersion, as the water covers us, corresponds to Christ's burial. But then the emergence, as we come up out of the water, corresponds to Christ's resurrection. The second meaning of baptism is figurative, and baptism means to be identified with. I am baptised with Christ. I identify with him. In verse 3, those of us who identify with Christ Jesus. This describes the point of conversion, that moment when we identify as Christians. Our identity is now rooted in Christ. Previously in Romans 5, we saw our identity was in Adam, driven by our sin or our old self. We lived primarily for ourselves, living for our careers, education, material worth, possessions, our position in the family and so on. When we identify with Christ, all of this can change. My ESV translation says, now we are Christians, we should not continue in sin because we are given an opportunity that we might walk in a new life. Verse 3, we are resurrected with him that we might now walk in this new life. But then in verses 5 to 11, Paul uses stronger terms. Before he says we might walk, now he says we must. There's an obligation for Christians to identify with Christ's resurrection, to walk in this new life. So what does this new life look like? This identifying with Jesus is so radical that Jesus himself described it as being reborn, being born of the Spirit. And Jesus lived this spirit-filled life. The spirit was so very visible at his baptism, but then also throughout his life. Jesus had a close relationship with God. He spoke to him, he heard from him, and he only ever acted to obey his father's wishes. And this is the new life that Paul tells us we must consider ourselves alive to. One of close relationship and obedience to our Father God. However, it's not quite so simple because the old self is still present. Our sinful nature has been crucified, but it has not been put to death. Crucified is not the same as death. Crucified in those days meant death will come, maybe in a couple of hours or maybe even a couple of days, but it's not the same as death. Likewise, when we identify with Jesus, our old self is marked for destruction. Its power is broken, and we're given the choice either to yield to the old self or to the new life. Now we are Christians, we should not continue in sin. But what Paul is making clear in verses 12 to 13 is that we are not immune from temptation. We are involved in a battle. It's still possible for the believing Christian to allow the old self to determine their thoughts and actions. Paul uses the term mortal bodies to make the point that this old self that contends with the new life is within our mortal bodies, and the battle therefore will not last forever. The NIV translation describes us as instruments, but other translations refer to weapons. And the battle imagery is consistent with Paul's other letters. Later in Romans, he will write of putting on the armor. When writing to the church at Corinth, he writes of the weapons of righteousness and of the weapons that that are not of this world. And of course, we all remember the Ephesians 6 passage, which lists the armour of God. The readers in Rome were involved in a personal battle, and each one of them was very much part of the battleground. In that conflict, either they operated as weapons of wickedness or weapons of righteousness. But Paul offers no middle ground. There is no place for neutrality. There was 
a battle in Rome. And the battle for those Christians in the first century Rome would have been to maintain their faith against an overwhelming opposing culture. Rome was the capital of the powerful Roman Empire, had a global presence, ruling a fifth of the world's people through its military might. Rome's enormous economic power came through taxation and trade. Rome's religion had many gods. From an initial array of their own gods and spirits, Rome added the Greek gods and the foreign cults from its conquered territories. In Rome, temples were everywhere. The worship of gods was an integral part of Roman life. Caesar himself was considered a god. Citizens had to worship Caesar. The rule was, as long as you worship Caesar, you could have your own gods too. Caesar Augustus was born a decade before Jesus, and this Caesar was heralded as the beginning of the good news. He was called the Son of God, bringing peace for the world. So no wonder then that Christian believers claiming Jesus as the one true Son of God and the Gospels as the true good news would clash so violently with the culture of Rome. There was a battle in Rome and there is a battle at home. There are clear parallels to today. Whilst our empire has long faded, still our culture supports a global influence through our overseas territories, our military, our role in NATO, and so forth. Economically, this little island of Northwest Europe is the sixth largest economy in the world. And the value we place on our economic strength is seen in every newspaper, news bulletin, or government strategy. And in terms of religion, our prevailing Northern Hemisphere Western worldview is that of a multi-faith society. All faiths are equal. There is no absolute exclusive truth. For those who profess no faith, there's celebrity worship, the pursuit of material things or life experiences to chase. The media broadcasts these values. Politicians endorse them. Celebrities validate them. And yet, Jesus tells us we should not store up treasures on earth, but store treasures in heaven. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Jesus also said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. In following Jesus' teaching, we are completely countercultural. To truly follow Jesus is to swim against the cultural current, the cultural current that would sweep us back into yielding to the old self. As Francis Chan says, if life is a river, then pursuing Christ requires swimming upstream. When we stop swimming or actively following him, we automatically begin to be swept downstream. There's a battle at home, and there's a personal battle for us to be won. Let's allow this letter this morning to take us back to the day of our baptism, our conversion. That day we first identified with Jesus, the day which changed the very course of our eternal life. How have we progressed since then? How's the battle going between our old self and the new life? Looking back, do we identify key decision moments in our lives which way did we turn? What was the driving force behind our choices? Because that same Holy Spirit present at Pentecost 2000 years ago is given to us at our baptism and will guide and encourage us in our Christian walk today. Jesus said, the spirit gives life and the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken, they are the spirit and they are life. So let's commit to read the words of Jesus more, to meditate, reflect, discuss and study God's word. Let's commit to prayer, asking for the spirit to guide us and take a quiet moment to listen to the spirit's prompting. If you're following the Francis Chan video series, Crazy Love in your home groups, look at the checklist he produced for avoiding lukewarm Christianity. 
I found it a very helpful guide for practical ways to check the status of my relationship with God. Take care with lists though, as verse 14 reminds us, we live in a relationship of love with God. We are under grace. We do not live in a transactional relationship under some form of legalism. So to answer Paul's opening question, now we are Christians, should we continue in sin? No. Our wrongs have been forgiven, but we don't continue living under the old self, because to live under our old self makes no sense. It would be a reversal of our identification with Christ. For each one of us, there's a personal battle to be won. How are we in yielding to this new life? We died with Christ. Are we still buried with him? Or have we been resurrected into this life, into the spirit? Be encouraged. Look at Rome today. Note the Vatican as the centre of the worldwide Catholic Church. And remember, we don't fight alone. We fight together and we are equipped by the Holy Spirit. Take some time reflecting with God this week. And next week, we'll continue in Paul's letter as he moves towards explaining more about life in the Spirit. So breathe on me, holy one. Come reveal your wonder now. Open wide my eyes to see. There's so much more. Jesus, you are where it all begins. Your beauty calls me deeper in. So stir a passion in my heart, God. Let it overflow. Let it overflow. So stir a passion in my heart, God. Let it overflow. Let it overflow. So breathe on me, Holy One. Come reveal your wonder now. Open wide my eyes to see. There's so much more. Cause Jesus, you. Are where it all begins. Your beauty calls me deeper in. So as a church will proclaim, stir fashion in our hearts, God. Let it overflow. Let it overflow. So stir a passion in my heart, God. Let it overflow. Let it overflow. So stir a passion in my heart, God. Let it overflow. Let it overflow. So stir a passion in my heart, God. Let it overflow. Let it overflow. We let it overflow. A passion for your kingdom to come, God. Passion for you to reign. So let it rise, let it rise. 
Holy fire burn inside Let it rise, let it rise Oh, oh Jesus Oh, let it rise, let it rise Holy fire burn inside Let it rise, let it rise Oh, for Jesus, oh Stir earth, ashes in my car of God Let it overflow Let it overflow Stir earth, ashes in my car of God Let it overflow let it overflow Let it rise, let it rise Holy fire burn inside Let it rise, let it rise Oh, for Jesus Oh, let it rise, let it rise Holy fire burn inside Let it rise, let it rise Oh, for Jesus, oh Sister, a passion in my heart, God Let it overflow Let it overflow Sister, a passion in my heart, God Let it overflow that it's overflow Sister, a passion in my heart, God That it's overflow That it's overflow Sister, a passion in my heart, God That it's overflow that it's overflow You let it overflow You let it overflow, God It's so good to be reminded that today we get to make a positive choice. Let me pray. Jesus, today we choose you. We acknowledge that you are the Holy One of God who has the words of eternal life and there is no other place we'd rather be. We choose new life. We say no to sinful ways of thinking and acting and we say yes to you. Thank you for the power of baptism and how we uh, can connect with your life, with your death, and with the new resurrection life. And this week, Jesus, we choose to follow you, renew our faith, encourage us, restore hope, reveal to us a deeper awareness of your love. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. And we're so thankful for those of you who are able to continue to support the church ministry uh, financially during this time. Details of how you can continue to help on the church website uh, and, and on the screen. God bless. See you next week.